for future use. Again, my name is Carol Gieske with the Elgin Area Chamber of Commerce. Thank you for coming in today. We are uh, gonna spend a short time together and hopefully no technical difficulties today. It's been wonderful working with my colleagues throughout the Fox River Valley, other chambers of commerce. We've come together to do some programming. This is another opportunity. So thanks to Geneva, St. Charles, Huntley, Bartlett, Hampshire, Elgin, Algonquin, Cary Grove, Northern Kane County chambers for joining us. Uh, before I introduce you to Dr. James Galvin, today's presenter, just a few notes. You're muted and appreciate you staying muted as we go through his presentation. If you have any questions, uh, please do type them in the chat box and we'll be able to share those at, in our Q question and answer session towards the end of this. Uh, the recordings then will be sent to each of the chamber directors and they will help facilitate the uh, program being released to, uh, to you and to others who couldn't join us today. Uh, we're going to leave plenty of time for questions and answers because we all know that we're going to have those. Uh, it is a joy to work with the board of directors. It is a challenge at time to work with volunteer boards of directors, uh, but there's no one better we can learn from today than Dr. Jim Galvin. Jim is here to talk about 20 best practices for board governance. He's going to share uh, his uh, techniques, his recommendations during this webinar. And you're going to see that these uh, 20 tips are going to be replicable and something you can install within your own board of directors as you enter into this new year of working at your not-for-profit. Jim is an Elgin resident. We're thrilled that uh, we have such talents here in the community. He's an organizational consultant who consults all over the world, specializing in strategy and in governance with uh, boards throughout the world and boards right here in his own backyard. He's focused on the potential of leadership and organizations and is so generous with his time to be with us once again today. Jim is also an author. You, If you were with us before, you saw that uh, Jim has written a number of books and perhaps he'll talk about his books at the end of this um, webinar as well. So thank you, Jim, for joining us, for your willingness to share. We are most appreciative of your knowledge and your expertise and your understanding of the positions that we are in as executive directors or presidents of organizations and also as volunteers within organizations on board of directors. So thank you, Jim. I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Carol. So you might be an organizational leader who has a board that you report to, or you might be a volunteer member of a board overseeing the work of an organizational leader. These best practices for board meetings uh, will apply whether you are a nonprofit, a congregation, or a chamber of commerce. Uh, these are uh, practices that you can adopt and implement right away uh, without much training or without much hassle, and it'll bring a lot of benefit. So if you're like me, you may uh, go to a board meeting and participate in it, be engaged, uh, actively engaged in it, and get really frustrated at times because of inefficiencies or uh, 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 relational difficulties or political challenges or just people not clear on the concept. And uh, these uh, practices can help alleviate uh, some of this pain. Um, the principles are coming from uh, uh, the book uh, that released this summer uh, called Maximizing Board Effectiveness. And if you were on the first call, you got a complimentary copy. This is the second in the series. And so if this is, if you weren't on the first call, uh, after uh, the webinar is over, uh, connect with your Chamber of Commerce and request a complimentary copy from me uh, of this book as a, a thank you for being on the webinar. And uh, these 20 practices are coming right uh, out of the back end of the book. So you feel frustrated sometimes in board meetings. And uh, one of the biggest uh, solutions to that is if you're a local board that meets like the third Tuesday of uh, every month or um, uh, something like that where you're meeting monthly during the week or Saturday morning, uh, you can simply set, and, and you know how you start at seven at night and it goes to like 10, 30, 11, 11, 30 at night before the board meeting's over. All you have to do is set a policy with a time limit that says something like this. No board meeting will exceed two hours in length without unanimous approval of all the board meetings. 
And what that does is put the pressure on to be organized, to be focused, not to get off track, not to go on, uh, you know, veer off on uh, some other kind of path. And it also encourages the chair to put the most important topics up front and the ones that need least discussion towards the end or the ones that could be put off towards a month. So that eliminates like the number one frustration of board meetings going late. It has to end after two hours, unless you're dealing with something uh, so critical that all the board members want to extend it another 30 minutes. So that's the first tip. I haven't even included that as a best practice. If you're part of a national board where people are driving in regionally or flying in from other cities, uh, have an informal get together and dinner the night before. So instead of starting eight o'clock in the morning at, at your office or wherever, wherever you're at a hotel, you got people flying in late, coming in late, that kind of thing. If you come in the night before, it's more relaxed. People get to know each other in an informal atmosphere because they don't relate to each other uh, uh, any, other, any other time of the year, except when they're together in the board meetings. If you're a local congregation, you're seeing each other every week. You, not right now, but you know who each other are already. So you have those relationships formed. So you don't need that night before kind of thing for a Tuesday night meeting. Uh, but if your people are coming in from a distance, uh, it's very wise to build in that informal time and even to make that mandatory. So a lot of boards uh, right now are meeting via Zoom. And I think what's gonna happen, I rarely make predictions about the future. I try not to, but it's already here. That's why I can predict this, is that board meetings are going to become hybrid. We're gonna have peop some people meeting live and some people tuning in during Zoom. And other boards like that are national in nature or regional in nature, uh, they're going to shift to Zoom. And I was just talking to Carol about the Elgin Chamber, and their board is meeting by Zoom like right now and likes it very much and might continue to meet by Zoom, even if they're free to gather and, and COVID is gone. So we're, the new normal is going to be this hybrid uh, kind of space. So that sort of uh, sets the table uh, for, for where we're at. And I wanted to start by sharing a diagram from the book about the kinds of problems that boards tend to have. So sometimes decisions can become complex, but there's two kinds of complexities for a nonprofit board. On the left side, you see the technical complexity. So technical complexity can be low or it could be high. So low technical complexity might be, how much cash should we hold in reserves? Or what's the, uh, uh, what's, what's the biggest check the organizational leader can write without board approval? Is it $1,000? Is it $10,000? Those are not highly uh, complex, but a decision like uh, shifting uh, technology to a new so software program, uh, changing our antiquated phone system to an internet protocol. I mean, how do you even understand what that is? Um, and so those are more technically complex or a real estate transaction where there's a, a, a potential uh, additional fees involved or a legal question. Okay, those are technically complex, high. So social complexity is on the horizontal part here of if everyone's friends or sort of all in agreement, there's low social complexity, we don't have sides, we don't have political factions. It's just, we're talking about the problem and we're gonna solve it. High social complexity is maybe there's two camps or three camps. Maybe there's constituencies that people are representing. Maybe there's other things political in nature about this. Maybe there's people who don't get along. Maybe there's one family who has historically controlled the board. Those are socially complex uh, problems. So if it's low in technical complexity, low in so social complexity, those are called tame problems. And those you just look at it, decide the pros and cons, discuss it for a while, pick the best solution, vote on it and move on. If it's high in technical complexity and low in social complexity, you're all working together as a team, but you have to do additional research. You have to get outside expertise. You gotta get on a learning curve to figure these out. So these are more difficult decisions to make, 
but they're not socially complex. There's no relational issues happening between your, it's just really hard to understand cognitively. Then in the same way, if it's low in technical complexity and high in social complexity, it's called messy problems. Like the director's wife is on staff and there's been an HR issue. That gets messy pretty fast, especially if some people are supportive of the wife and other people thought this was a, gonna be a conflict of interest right from the beginning and never voted for it. That's social complexity. Those are called messy problems. But what happens if you have a difficult relational situation, difficult social dynamics, and you're dealing with a highly, highly technically complex problems, those we call wicked messes. <laughs> and you wanna stay out of that quadrant uh, as, much, as much as possible. So, I'm gonna stop sharing and we're back live. The next PowerPoint, I'm gonna walk through the 20 or so best practices. And these are uh, replicable, replicable actions you can take, relatively easy to implement, that'll immediately improve the effectiveness of your board meeting. And best practices are ideas you can borrow from other boards and use to make your board uh, more effective. You might feel guilty just blatantly copying what other people are doing, but that's what best practices are about. Sometimes it just makes it a lot easier and really works. Here's best practice number one. So you've probably been to a board meeting where you show up and you get a pile of handouts or even a binder that's called a board book with all this information that you haven't seen before. Uh, that's problematic because as the chair is trying to lead the meeting, uh, everyone's looking at the papers, trying to get on top of what, you know, what do we have in here instead of listening to the meeting and participating. Or um, uh, even uh, sending these out ahead of time. Today, we can do this all by email and have it be all electronic. So if three to five days ahead of time, any handout that the director's gonna give, uh, that, that, that the organizational leader is gonna give, put those in email, send it to the board three to five days ahead of time. And when you show up at the board meeting, there are no new handouts. Everything that you're gonna see, that, that the director wants you to see or the chair wants you to see, you already have. And you can either bring your iPad, laptop, or you can print them out at home and bring the hard copy. Some people prefer to refer to the documents digitally. Some people refer, prefer to refer to them on paper, hard copy. And what I'm finding in boards I'm working with across the country is that the split right now is about 50-50. So about half the people bring their iPad, about half the people print out some or all the reports at home uh, and, and bring them with. So that's number one, email ahead of time, print out at home, and it saves trees. Number two, consent agenda. Some of you probably already know what this is. Some of you probably already use it, but instead of the director or other staff giving verbal reports or giving you a written report ahead of time and then telling you what the written, written report says during the meeting, uh, a consent agenda takes all those reports were sent ahead of time and puts them at the center of the table. And the first agenda item is before we vote to receive all these uh, reports, does anybody have a question? So in a church situation, um, a person might say, I have a question on the youth ministry report. Chair pulls that out, puts it aside. Someone else, I got a question about the pastor's report. Pull that out, set it aside. All in favor of receiving these reports, raise your hand. Reports are received. Now, what was your question on youth ministry? Oh, is there going to be a retreat this summer? Yes, in July. What's your question on the pastor's report? Asks it, pastor answers it, boom. In five or 10 minutes, you've just taken care of what used to be an hour's worth of verbal reports from committee chairs or uh, staff people or the organizational leader. Um, and hearing those verbal reports is kind of boring. 
And if you can get them writing ahead of time and read them, be done with them, it's faster and better. And the other part is with those verbal reports, the information that's in them, you can't govern with that information because it, that's what happened last month. And you can't change what happened last month. It's nice to know, to be on top of what's happening, but you can get that in writing instead and spend your time in the board meetings talking about the future because that's the only thing you can change. Number three, a dashboard of key indicators. Now, some people have these at work where there's a dashboard report of some kind that has these Excel charts in color, one side and one sheet of paper that, that measure the critical variables uh, in the organization. Wouldn't it be nice to have one for your nonprofit too? Most do not because you don't know, have anyone skilled enough in Excel to make those little charts. But wouldn't it be nice to see monthly giving totals over the past 12 months or giving by month compared to the same month over the past three years or worship attendance at church or number of volunteers per year over the past five years. Any numbers that are key like that, that you want to know about, uh, you can collect that data. You can have someone, uh, an Excel spreadsheet jockey, turn that into uh, a visual report and that that visual indicator is so much easier to grasp than looking through a bunch of numbers i highly recommend doing the same thing with key budget numbers um, uh, so uh, where are are our total assets how much do we have in cash reserve uh, month by month over the last 12 months so you can see if the cash reserve is going down or going up just by looking at the chart and it just makes being on the board so much easier. And don't we all want it to be so much easier? Standing committees are sort of assumed to be uh, uh, how boards function. You have a governance committee, a finance committee, you got an audit committee, the university setting, you got a student affairs committee, uh, marketing committee, uh, those kind of things. For large bureaucratic boards, mm, yeah. Having standing committees would be okay, but if you're a small nonprofit or a congregation or a chamber of commerce, you don't really need standing committees. And in some universities I've worked with, I've seen they have to make up work for the standing, standing committees because standing committee meets on Tuesday and they do their work on Wednesday of the full board meeting, all the committees give their report and the board as a whole makes decisions on those. But when you're a smaller nonprofit, you don't need that. Uh, if you have to form a committee to, you know, like make a recommendation of uh, what, do we, what do we project our charitable income will be next year? Uh, given COVID and everything else, it's, the board's too big to decide that. Let's get three people who understand finances, take a look at it, take a look at our giving, do a little research and come back with a number for us. That's called an ad hoc committee. So you meet once or twice, come back with the data and then you're done or the recommendation. Uh, and then that committee doesn't meet anymore. And that's the best practice way to do it because it takes less time, it's faster, it's more nimble. You can form ad hoc committees on anything any, anytime you want as a board to do some work. And um, and you don't need those standing committees, which tend to make the meetings more bureaucratic. This is a brand new uh, best practice, beginning and ending each meeting with an executive session. Those of us who do consulting with boards full-time nationally have just decided this should be and is a best practice. The executive session is when the board gets together and they, they excuse the organizational leader, put him or her outside the meeting, and then talk just as a board uh, about whatever they need to talk about. So best practice is once at the beginning and once at the end. Now, personally, I'm okay with doing it only at the beginning or doing it only at the end, but it's a chance for the board to get their act together before they bring the organizational leader back in. 
And it's, it's sort of like, hey, I heard this criticism about the president. Is this something we should bring up? Is this a board level issue? So you can talk about it as a board to decide whether or not you should bring it up. Or um, you might say, hey, I got this question, you know, about our nonprofit, but I don't, is this a staff issue? Is this a board issue? And so the whole board can sort that out and say, no, it's a staff issue. That, that's not for this meeting. Just bring that right to the director. So um, what this does, it, it eliminates the, the uh, coffee at Starbucks the day before meeting and it eliminates the parking lot discussion after the board meeting because they can they have a chance to talk it out right there. So it can be a little bit awkward for the organizational leader. It can feel awkward because what are they talking about in there and how come it's taking so long? But if you do it consistently every meeting, it's, it just becomes routine and the organizational leader can relax. I was working with the board at Judson University a couple of years ago. And after you know the beginning uh, 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 inspirational devotional uh, time, they excused the president and me out of meeting. And so I sat down. So I just asked him about his family, asked him about his kids. And I started looking at my watch. And pretty soon, it's been 30 minutes that we're sitting outside and the board's talking about something. I started getting nervous. So I asked him, do they always take this long for executive session? He goes, oh, yeah, it happens every time. And after full 45 minutes, then they called us back in and I did my presentation. So the president was just fine because it's routine, it happens every meeting. Jim, may I interrupt you for just a moment? You're using a PowerPoint. Did you want to share that with everybody at this time? You're not seeing the PowerPoint? No, we aren't. Uh, gosh. It's called messing up. Well, the conversation is there we go. You started screen. Oh, there we are. Okay, so the first best practice is email everything ahead of time. Don't don't bring new yeah. handouts during the meeting. Next one is use a consent agenda. Put all the reports in the middle of the table. See if there's any questions before you receive them. Dashboard of key indicators. Use ad hoc committees, set of standing committees. Begin and end each meeting with an executive session. And next, build a pipeline. So if you're a membership organization or a congregation um, where everyone's already members and the board meetings are chosen from the organizational members, you sort of have a built-in pipeline because if you're not a member, you don't get to be part of the board. But if you have an independent nonprofit, you can benefit by developing some kind of special group, an advisory group, a blue council, blue ribbon council of advisors to the director or uh, a special gathering of major donors or uh, key volunteers that produce a pipeline where the potential board members can get to know each other. Maybe you have a reception or dinner together, the current board members with potential board members. So you can see if the chemistry is right and see if there's someone who can be a potential, potentially good board member and building this pipeline sort of mechanism uh, uh, prevents what usually happens is you got someone rotating off the board and you have to find two more board members and you sit around and look at each other and go, who could we get that's good? And someone says, oh, I have this friend, Bill. He's an insurance salesman. I think he'd be a good member. And we say, okay, go ask him. And we've never met him. We don't trust chemistry. We don't know if he's passionate about the work that we do. Um, and so it just leads to recruiting substandard board members and always being in a rush uh, to, try, to try to find new board members. I've had this happen with nonprofits in Elgin. Them bear, meeting me once and then asking me if I want to be on their board. And I have to refuse because I don't know who else is on the board. I don't know what shape the organization is. I don't know nothing. Next is using hand signals in case the discussion gets off track. So um, the diet and wool micromanagers will keep wanting to drill down, ask questions, get into the weeds. 
And at some point, whether you're a governing board or whether you're managing board, you have to have some kind of signal to say, hey, let's hit the pause button here. Are we doing board work or are we doing staff work right now? And uh, some of my colleagues, you know, print out little red stop signs and a popsicle stick. And in the meeting, anyone can hold up the stop sign and everyone stops talking and they go, oh, are we doing board work, staff work? Oh, we're sort of off the topic here. We're not, we're not doing what we we're supposed to be doing. So let's leave this in the hands of the director and keep going. And in one board uh, that I was on, where we shifted over to policy-based governance, meeting once a month, just getting started, uh, all I had to do was clear my throat and people go, what? So this kind of simple uh, mechanism uh, can save a lot of minutes in the board meeting. A process check is in your typical agenda, having two or three questions uh, uh, like, did we treat each other with respect? Is there anybody to, that needs to apologize for anything they said? And this brings, this allows a simple tool for bringing account, a mutual accountability to the board members for their individual behavior. One group I worked with that didn't have this had a new board member come on. This is a private high school somewhere in the US, stand on the chair and yell at all the other board members and call them stupid and idiots. And they asked me, what, we, what should we do? I said, get rid of the guy. So this was an association of churches sponsoring the high school. So they went to that pastor, explained what happened. He said, I'm sorry, you know, we'll, we'll remove him from the board. And they said, why did you let him on the board if you knew this might happen? And he said, well, we don't allow him to serve on any boards in our church. <laughs> So Jim, I'm going to interrupt you one more time. We have about 30 minutes left, and I just want to bring a couple of questions up that have come into chat before yeah, we let's do them. too much further. And one of the questions is, well, how do you do the night before dinner without violating the Open Meetings Act? Uh, I don't know the technical uh, uh, requirements behind that, but if you can't do it, you can't do it. You mean... Or if, if, if you're subject to the Open, uh, open Meeting Act, you can't get to know each other. You can't have a dinner. You can make, you can make a rule not to discuss board business during that informal time because you're trying to build relationships. You're not like pre-digesting all the content. Yeah, and isn't Open Meetings Act just for governmental and educational? I mean, it's not for not-for-profits, C3s, is it? No, it's, it's, I'm sure it's all governmental, but I'm not, a, I'm not a lawyer. Yeah, I'm thinking that that's what that is. Um, and then, uh, let's see, the same with uh, meetings, the closed session before and the closed session after. One of the questions uh, is, you know, how do you record minutes or what are your obligations for recording minutes during a closed session when nobody is there to uh, take those minutes? Well, a school board is different than a nonprofit doing an executive session. So uh, the government agencies have uh, set requirements for that, and uh, that's all nailed down. For nonprofit, you're having informal discussion to get your act together and to tweak the agenda before you begin the meeting where you actually take the minutes. And the minutes, by the way, should not reflect all the discussion in the meeting. The minutes should only reflect board actions. The board decided X, the board decided Y, the bid for this. Uh, repair was approved uh, rather than discussion of various opinions about that uh, you don't need to, re to record and report that the kiss theory just really uh, is applicable to that isn't it just to get those facts and get the motions and then it, uh, record the action and move forward exactly good all right well we have 30 minutes left if you wouldn't mind continuing and appreciate it. If, if people have any questions please put them in chat so you're saying you want me to finish on time <laughs> so, um, I just, there we go. So, another simple thing you can do is uh, on your website, have something like this that, that uh, shows donors, volunteers, and everyone else who your board members are. 
I worked with one, one nonprofit and they said, well, another consultant told us, don't let anyone know who your board members are, keep it secret. Well, that doesn't build trust. And for a national organization, this helps the board members actually get to know each other. Uh, I was flown to one nonprofit uh, on a private jet to a private compound in the Rocky Mountains. And we we're at the airport waiting for the two other private jets to come and deliver all the other board members. So the two jets come about the same time and we all get together in a circle. And here's what they said. Hi, what's your name again? Yeah, hi, huh, what's your name again? It's like these guys are mega millionaires and their habit was to have a board meeting start at 10 and end at two in Michigan, flying in from different parts of the country so that the board meeting would take less, would, would take you know, less, uh, a full day or less for them. They could all fly in and get to Michigan, do the meeting, 10 to two, fly back out. And they weren't taking that time to build relationships. Uh, so just it's a simple website like this. Uh, I've, I've also worked with some organizations where uh, because of potential for physical harm, uh, they don't want the organization to know, the board members don't want their name out there uh, or for uh, 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 social media attacks or that, that kind of thing. So there are exceptions. And uh, if you're a church, you can put it on your website. Uh, if you wanna be more private, you can have just a private website that only members with the password uh, can go to, et cetera. But it's simple to do. Every organization has a website. You can do a bio with photos of your board members and people sometimes wanna know. Um, as, as a board, especially if you're a governing board, Sometimes they're reluctant to do to survey staff or board or donors or anything because they feel like that's getting into management issues. My opinion is it's not. You can do a survey if you're governing board. You can do a survey on anything you want. You can survey university students. You can survey faculty. You can survey donors. You can survey parents of preschoolers, uh, whatever kind of nonprofit uh, you're running. Uh, survey uh, new owners of uh, who have uh, rescued a pet from your shelter. Uh, and as a board, you're, you're not interfering in management, you're gathering information. Now, if you take that information and start telling the director what to do, now you're micromanaging. But if you're just gathering the information uh, and you can survey on anything you want, pretty much. Refreshments during the meeting, even if the meeting's just seven to nine, having a cup of coffee or a bottle of water halfway through, this makes the meeting a lot more bearable. And uh, you can get a twofer by uh, having a meal together when we're past COVID, having, having a meal together as a board at six and then starting your meeting at seven. And there's something, and, and uh, pay attention to the physical layout too. Like, like this kind of layout is very poor for a board meeting. If you go to a hotel and, and rent a room and they call it the boardroom, they give you a really long table like this. And this is designed to prevent discussion because only one person sitting at the table can see everyone in the eye. Uh, and if you uh, rent a movie like Meet Joe Black and the CEO comes in, there's a secret board meeting that's been called. They're all sitting at a table like this. They all have suits on. There's no discussion. There's just an argument between two people and then a vote. That's no way to run a board meeting. So you want to shape more like a U or a circle or a square or that type of thing, especially if you have a board member of board size, you know, 15 or under, uh, that's pretty easy to do. Right now you want to make sure they're spaced at least six feet apart. Hang time, having a meal together, uh, going to a, uh, a, a recreational place together where you can play, you know, games and eat junk food and hang out for a while, uh, go to a Chinese buffet. Um, there's something about food that breaks down the barriers between people. And so sharing a meal together, asking about each other's families, and you can even do this with spouses. 
uh, as well. So you get to know them more as human beings. And in the more board members know each other, the more trust can build, the more they can work together as a team, the higher functioning they are as a board of directors. A retreat once a year is a best practice. It doesn't have to be off site. It doesn't have to be overnight, uh, but it's better if it is. And these retreats uh, allow you time to get into more strategic discussions. So you can deal with the routine uh, board issues right away and you still got the rest of the day or two days to retreat together, talk about the future, talk about the strategy and vision for moving forward. Talk about the challenges you have recovering from COVID and the new normal that you're very soon going to be facing. What's different uh, in your environment now uh, that wasn't there before. Two things are going to be different is wearing masks is going to be socially acceptable even when we're past COVID. And people coming, attending meetings by Zoom is going to be totally acceptable. Uh, whereas before it was not, it was only in case of emergency. So board retreat once a year, if you're not doing it, you will highly benefit from it. Every board member of a charitable nonprofit needs to be financially invested in an organization. And what happens is, you know, you have two, more, you have two members rotating off. You got to find two more board members. You find a, that insurance guy, He's willing to serve on the board. He's honored to be able to do it, but he's not a donor. He's not a volunteer. He doesn't know much about your work. And so if you have a whole board filled with those kind of people, you got people who aren't giving to your work, asking for other people to give money to the work so that the board can spend their money. It's a little bit of a hypocritical situation. So you want board members to be financially invested in your work. If they're not, or if they refuse to be, they're not qualified to help you make financial decisions. It's just a lot better. Their, their passion level is gonna follow their giving level. And you want board members that are engaged and passionate about your work. You don't want board members who only show up at half the meetings and then ask critical questions about how money's being spent when they're not uh, participating and giving any of it. So it's, it's a little bit touchy, like, well, actually, how do you do that? And so it ought to be part of the recruitment information up front is you need to be a donor at a certain level, or you need to be a donor of record, which means you've donated and gotten a receipt and the organization knows how much you give, or you have to give at least X amount of dollars uh, per year. So one university in the Midwest, I know one of the board members, and the requirement is you have to give 10 million to be on the board. So for a lot of faith-based organizations, they feel really funny giving a certain dollar amount for other uh, secular independent nonprofits. You have a little more leeway to set whatever kind of a bar uh, that you want for that. But everyone needs to be involved financially. And if they just can't, then maybe you need to find a different board member. Uh, the organizational leader should receive a performance review once a year. He or she deserves to know how they're doing. And if you're a governing board, you only focus on two areas, uh, limitations policies and ends policies. Uh, were any limitations policies violated and what kind of progress are made in ends policies. So you're, you're reviewing uh, the performance of the organization more than the, the indiv individual management of the leader. The same principle holds true if you're a managing board, you don't have these kind of policies. What you wanna review is how did the nonprofit do this year under your leadership rather than how did you do as a leader and is your desk or office messy? And are you dressing appropriately? And uh, do you need to go to a workshop on fundraising or something like that? You wanna focus on organizational performance and that's what, the, what, that's what the review should be. So if you look at publicly traded companies, big ones with their CEO, what are they evaluated on? How the business is doing in stock price and assets. They're not evaluated on their 
individual behavior as a manager. Once a year, you should review the bylaws. It's amazing how many board members can't find the bylaws, don't have a copy of it, haven't read it in four years. If as a board, everyone reviews it once a year and highlights anything they think might be changed and make that an agenda item uh, in your board meeting. They usually don't have to be changed much at all, but this keeps the board on track and uh, keeps you in uh, within the limitations of your current bylaws. It's against Illinois state, Illinois state law to violate your own bylaws. Board self-assessment is a, uh, you know, 75, 85 uh, question survey that will look at every aspect of your governance and allow the board members to rate the board on a scale of one to five and you combine all that. There is a free assessment in the back of my book in the appendix it has 85 questions uh, that you can answer on a scale of one to five and put together. I offer an electronic version of this where I put it all out by electronic survey, compile it all, uh, give you the graphic report of the uh, uh, detail and a 90 minute, um, 90 minute feedback by Zoom for $1,000. If that's something you're interested in, but you can do it on your own on paper for free. Perpetual calendar is uh, if you meet monthly, what items have to be uh, uh, handled every month. So in, when are you gonna do the bylaw review? January? When do you start the budget narrative? When do you have to approve a final budget? Uh, when do you have to talk about annual, um, annual banquet? Um, so if you have all those laid out ahead of time, it's really easy for the board chair to take the typical agenda, look at the month, insert those items, and you're not gonna miss anything, you're not gonna forget because it's uh, on your perpetual calendar or annual calendar. You need an orientation program of some kind, so you can have them read my book. Uh, you can have them read a book by Carver if you're a governing board. Um, you can include some other magazine articles uh, that you found helpful. Uh, include your bylaws, include all your governing policies if you're a governing board, include any other foundational documents like mission, vision, values, that type of thing. Include a history of your organization if you have a long history so that when a board member shows up to the first meeting, they feel ready to contribute starting on day one. What typically happens is they don't get any orientation and they come to the meetings and they're sort of quiet and they just watch what's happening for the first six months and they're not able to make a contribution until they figure out how things are done around here. Jim, may I interrupt one more time? Uh, it's 2.15, we've got about 10 minutes left for this and then additional questions. One of the things I think about with orientation for the board member and how important that is, do you recommend peer orientation or staff orientation or a hybrid orientation? Mm -hmm with new board members. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so you need the content or your orientation in the process. So do you have three people take the new board member out for coffee? Do you set up a buddy system where there's one board member that, that talks with the other board member and they can connect on phone before and after their first meeting? Uh, do you have an actual training session uh, where you walk through this? I'm gonna be doing this with uh, Willow Creek's new board in January is doing a training session for uh, all their new board members using some of this PowerPoint. Um, so there's uh, lots of flexibility in how you do that. Last is, especially for the board chair, who may or may not feel comfortable in the position, is get some coaching. So who can coach you? Well, it can be the former chair, the retired chair, you can connect with and get some coaching. You could be the chair of another nonprofit that's like yours. You can hire, uh, pay some money for a coach uh, to help you, or you can bring in a consultant to work with the whole board. And the idea here is um, 
uh, uh, you can get it for free with spending money on coaching or that type of thing uh, to train up the board and skill up the board is a lot cheaper than the board making bad decisions. So you've been frustrated, you wanna do better, implementing these best practices can help. And we have more than 10 minutes for question and answer. Thanks, Jim. That's really helpful information as so many of us are working with boards of directors and really value their input and their uh, ability to guide us along the way, but recognizing that they have their roles as well as we have our roles as paid staff members, um, and then um, trying to work within the, the uh, structure of the organization or the uh, church. Uh, one of the things before we go much further is I want to make sure uh, folks know how to get a hold of you, Jim. Your website is Galvin and Associates, G-A-L-V-I-N and Associates.com. So uh, if folks have any questions, you can go to Jim's website. Uh, so let's open it up if anyone might have any questions at this point in time. Um, one of the things that I think is interesting is, is you know, we've never been through um, this uh, situation with COVID before, with so many things going virtual. What are, you know, what's the influence of COVID as we move forward, six months, nine months from now, when we might be back to normal? What do you think, from your perspective, COVID will have done to the not-for-profit network relative to board and governance? Yeah, you asked me to make, to make a prediction, which I, I know. Can't. Tend not to do, but uh, when I look at McKinsey Consulting's pr predictions, which is uh, uh, has some really good data on it, uh, COVID most likely will be with us through 2023. Uh, herd immunity most likely scenario is going to be 10 months from now. So I think we're because we're already using Zoom, we're going to keep using Zoom. Board meeting is going to be hybrid. Um, when, we, if, when we meet face to face, when that's safe, some people will still still wear masks, either either for just general health reasons or because they've chosen not to get a vaccine. Uh, so it will it will complicate matters, and maybe a while before we're shaking hands and hugging again. Yeah, I would say. Uh, one of the questions is, would you recommend dashboard items to track progress on strategic plan items? And I, I think that begs the question too, is as many of us enter a new year and talk about strategic planning, how do we plan this post-COVID planning period? Yeah, long long range planning right now is nine months Yeah. Uh, ahead of time. So um, if there are new initiatives, uh, you should have a way of keeping uh, track of that. Uh, after doing a str uh, strategic planning uh, event with someone, uh, I finished it off with a, um, uh, a dashboard, red light, yellow light, green light on all the initiatives, you know, like usually there's 17 or 18 of them. And then is it, is it green, everything's on track? Is it yellow, we're falling behind? If it's red, we got a big problem. Um, and gray, if you haven't started the initiative yet. And then on that one side of one sheet of paper, um, you can keep track of how things are going. If everything's on track, you don't have to, if it's green, you don't have to talk about it. Um, and that saves some time as well. But the board ought to be involved in strategy. The board ought to track, track progress of strategic initiatives. And that's a place where they can add value. There's some directors that don't want the board to have any um, uh, any say in the strategy, just tell us the ends where you want us to go and we'll do the strategy ourselves. And that varies from board to board to board, but the board ought to know the strategy, the board ought to approve the strategy and the board ought to be updated on the strategy, whether they're participating actively or not. Any other questions for Jim this afternoon? All right, I don't see any in chat. So Jim, our thanks to you again for being with us, Galvin and Associates. Jim does a lot of strategic uh, consulting, so don't hesitate to go to his website uh, and look up galvinandassociates.com. Uh, if you have any questions, please send them on to uh, your chamber director. 
we will be releasing this information, as I said earlier, in a video back to each chamber. So that's a reference for you. Jim, again, thank you very much for your expertise and sharing your tips with us. We really value your time and the knowledge that you're able to uh, share with us. To all of you, I hope that you will stay safe, remain safe through this holiday season into 2021. And uh, we'll see you with additional programming. Oh, I'm sorry, Jim. And feel free to contact your chamber for a complimentary copy of the book. Thank you. And all of you who are serving on boards are doing honorable work. You have a chance to make an impact. We have to stick to board work and stay out of staff work. Right? And, and we, didn't, we didn't talk about that a lot, but that is, there is a fine line. And you got to look to the future, not to the past. That's where you make your contribution. And every, every board ought to make, make a net contribution to the organization, not just take up time, space, and oxygen. Good advice. All right, all. Thank you very much. We'll be seeing you in 2021 with some additional programming. Happy holidays. Stay well. Thanks for joining us.